If I was in a zombie apocalypse, I can't say my first instinct would be to get a camcorder out of the cupboard just so I could film all the dangerous scrapes I'd be about to get myself into just in case the army turn up and repair society again, which is the only way those videotapes would ever be worth anything. But thankfully, most movie characters do have this instinct. Even when faced with imminent death any second, they will just keep on rolling. Hi guys, so the other night I re-watched The Zombie Diaries, a film I often get mixed up with George Romero's Diary of the Dead, which is on this triple pack box set. It might not be obvious through the camera. I thought this would be a good film to move on to, The Zombie Diaries, having recently reviewed 28 Days Later, because they're sort of from a similar subgenre of film, and yet they, they're also polar opposites. 28 Days Later is a film which is about an outbreak that starts in London and spreads outwards. The Zombie Diaries, okay, I don't think the outbreak starts in London in, in The Zombie Diaries. I think it's from abroad, but it, but it touches down in London for the first time and then spreads outwards. So mostly quite similar to 28 Days Later. But whereas 28 Days Later is a really big budget, action heavy, <laughs> cinematic zombie film with big famous actors, The Zombie Diaries is almost indie level really I mean we're talking really down low on, on the scale of maybe Blair Witch Project probably the Zombie Diaries cost more than the Blair Witch Project they would have had more actors to pay in the Zombie Diaries that's that's my logic but 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 you get the idea this film it has a plot structure which is sort of similar to Pulp Fiction so in Pulp Fiction you've got like three or four different stories and they're all linked together but they're not necessarily played in the right chronological order the Zombie Diaries goes for that exact same thing. It's literally like somebody watched Pulp Fiction one night and thought, I, I, I'd quite like to do a zombie version of that. That would be really cool. But in this film, you won't get characters driving around in, in suits talking about McRoyals with cheese as zombies are walking around in the background. There's nothing light in, the, in this film. The Zombie Diaries is an ultra-serious portrayal of people on the outskirts of London in the more rural areas desperately trying to survive uh, the, the initial stages of an outbreak. This is proper boots on the ground stuff, guerrilla style people in the in the woods, just n no idea what the hell to do, woods, fields, villages. I can't think of a single joke that's ever made in this film. It, it goes for ultra serious and just because it's cheap it doesn't that, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's worse than 28 days later either another way in which this film is the complete opposite of 28 days later though is in the type of zombie so in 28 days days later you get these ultra fast zombies that just they're, they're sprinting you know they're, they're super super fast the fa fastest zombies i've ever seen in a zombie film apart from maybe the day of the dead remake from 2006 which sped them up in the editing room to the point that they looked like insects it was ridiculous but the zombie diaries wisely because of the budget they go for the more slow moving romero type zombie films except i think they go even further than that because good lord the zombies are slow in this film like if they if they were going any slower they they literally wouldn't be moving but i think it's good for a a lower budget film to to go for the slower moving ones because it just means that you can you can have a very simple setup and keep zombies in frame for a lot longer but just to give you an example of how slow the zombies are in this um take a look at this i'll show you myself The three main stories in this all attempt to show a different stage of a zombie outbreak. So our first story, for instance, is what you would call our ground zero story. We've got a group of journalists who are going outside London to interview somebody in a village in Hertfordshire. But what they don't know is that the outbreak is literally starting behind their backs just after they've set off. So they're quite lucky in a way, actually, although... I probably shouldn't use that word given what happens to some of these characters later on in the film. But yeah, once they arrive at their destination, the outbreak is literally happening. Uh, we don't get to see any of the chaos in the capital. This, this film is just way too low budget for that. Although to be fair, even 
a film like 28, 28 Days Later didn't show the the outbreak starting, maybe in something like World War Z, you would see that. I, I've, I've not seen that film with Brad Pitt. I've, I've seen a few clips of it, but not the whole film. But it's fine in the zombie diaries uh, with us not seeing what's going on in London. We can use our imagination. So that's the first story. Second story, I think, takes place maybe a few days after the first one but still very, very early on. So we've got three characters driving around in a car, just hunting for supplies. I get the impression that these people don't have a base set up yet, a proper base camp that they're making their home. They seem to be in a little bit of a tailspin, like they haven't got used to what the hell's going on. They're sort of driving around randomly. They're, they're arguing a little bit. They don't know what the hell to do. They're just scavenging for stuff blindly in a bit of a panic. Uh, so again, I think it's very, very early doors. There's a little bit of a cheat in this second story because one of the characters has got like a sniper rifle or something, but from where? This this is the UK. Guns are banned in the UK. It doesn't make any sense. I, I, I kind of wonder if this film was written by an American because generally people in middle class homes, they don't, they, they can't suddenly produce big rifles like this the minute that a zombie outbreak starts nobody has guns in this country that they're not just lying around for people to use in in a situation like this i think if there was actually a zombie outbreak in the uk finding a gun would be like finding willy wonka's golden ticket it would be near impossible i, I think what would actually happen in, in reality is that people would make a mad dash for the the police stations because obviously even in the UK we, we th there will be guns in like the police station lockups I think people would make a dash for those but even then most people wouldn't know how to use the guns because Britons just don't have any experience of using guns like I'm 42 I've only seen one gun in my entire lifetime which was in a cabinet at a friend's house this one time uh, his dad kept like handguns in this cabinet but be behind glass I I've never actually touched one I think Americans generally have more the experience of that you know um even in the third story in this film the characters seem to have loads of access to guns it's like how it just just wouldn't happen anyway this third story i think is it takes the biggest time jump it's like a few weeks after the second story we've got like the first signs of a, a little community starting up there's maybe 12 people just randoms who have all kind of come together after the outbreak and joined up and they're kind of they've got like a perimeter and that they've set up guard routines and stuff uh, there's like a farmhouse and a few buildings so three very distinct stories all linked together one thing this film does very well is it makes nighttime a threat this isn't something that i always see in zombie films or zombie tv shows the walking dead for example brilliant show i've been watching it recently but there's no difference between daytime and nighttime. Once it gets to night, everywhere is just hugely lit up. There's no extra danger for the characters, seemingly, most of the time, anyway. In the Zombie Diaries, everything's super realistic, like I said earlier. Like, electricity's all gone. The, the only light in the world is from, like, whatever torches you have or, uh, you know, fire on a stick, that kind of thing. Whatever you can muster up, but there's a lot of darkness. And there are times in this when there are scenes happening where you can see the light is fading. And you can you can sense that unease, that edge among the characters that the most dangerous type of time of day is approaching. That there's a massive difference in this film between daytime and nighttime. And because the zombies are really, really slow, it seems to make them extra dangerous at nighttime for me because they can suppress their own sound a lot easier because they're walking so slow. So and given the fact that most of the film is in, in and around woods and countryside areas, yet nighttime is a massive threat in this. Like any zombie film worth its salt, this one has a big human threat in the form of Goke and his sidekick Manny. This is a very key character because he is the only person, I think, who features heavily in two of the three stories. So he's a key bridging mechanism and he's a really effective villain. He's a, he's a pure psychopath. He kills, he rapes. He's got this knowing smile on his face, which I just find really creepy. To look at, he sort of reminds me of the Uruguayan footballer Luis Suarez, who used to play for Liverpool, which is hugely ironic, actually, because Goke seems to have a Liverpoolian accent. At least I used to think he did, but I looked up the actor's bio quite recently. It turns out he's Welsh, so maybe I'm wrong about the accent, although Liverpool and Wales are quite close together, so maybe there's a little bit of 
crossover there but between accents but one thing's for damn sure he's definitely not a southerner so i've got to ask the question what the hell was goke and his buddy doing in the woods in rural hertfordshire at the time that this outbreak started seemingly they were just walking around the woods down south in tracksuits like doing nothing uh, I, I love that that mystery and the fact that it's just never explained it's absolutely brilliant there are other unanswered questions as well such as what happens to mané after the first story he just disappears and doesn't come back from the th back for the third story even though goke does also what what is it that flips goke over the edge in the third story we're never really shown like one minute some of the characters are suspicious about him and then we change scenes and goke is on a murderous rampage it feels like we've missed a scene there where there's like a big confrontation but I do like that about this film, that not everything's fully explained for you. You've got to piece one or two things together, um, kind of. So Goke's definitely, for me, the standout character in this. I, I love the way that he he's friendly with people when he first meets them, and then he'll just flip, like any moment, you know. He's kind of like, oh, you're right then. I, I can't do his accent, but he'll, he'll be really good with you, and then just suddenly turn, like... <laughs> halfway through a story he reminds me a little bit of Mick from Wolf Creek you know he, he, he'd do the same thing it'd be kind of like hey can I, can I come and join your barbie and then five minutes later he'd have the machete out and he'd be taking people out you know uh, Goke's a bit like that none of the other characters really make that much of an impression there are some shaky performances in terms of the acting I, I kind of feel like some of the performers in this film maybe didn't fully believe that anybody would ever watch this film apart from family members so it's easy for me to imagine some of these scenes being filmed in like country lanes and things and maybe some of these actors just couldn't quite throw themselves into it 100%. It feels like some of them are only giving like 90% of themselves but unbeknown, unbeknownst to them this film did actually do quite well. It, it, it did get a little bit of a following, it did get some attention. I, I think it's one of the better known indie films from like 10, 15, 20 years ago. But yeah, so that would be one of my weaknesses. Some of the acting um, isn't great. And I, I'm normally very forgiving on that kind of stuff. I, I'm not going to name names. I don't like to beat up on lower league actors. But you will sense that one or two people are not quite giving it their all. Another weakness would be the fact that this film copies a key scene from Night of the Living Dead. And I really don't like that. So the scene I'm talking about is... Uh, so at the end of Night of the Living Dead... Uh, the main character comes out of the house and the cops shoot him because they think he's a zombie. That happens in this film as well. And I'm kind of like, no, don't do that. And, and, it, and it didn't have to happen in this film. This character, he could have died in the nighttime graveyard scene um, and then just stumbled into the survivor's camp as a zombie and then been shot down. And that could have been our tenuous link between stories two and three. They didn't have to copy that Night of the Living Dead thing. So that's another sort of minor weakness right there. But... Overall, I did really thoroughly enjoy this film. So I'll quickly show you the version of the film that I've got for this. Here is my DVD copy of The Zombie Diaries. I did briefly hold it aloft earlier. I don't believe there's any Blu-ray version for this. If you want to own this film on home media, I think this is the best copy you're going to get. But honestly, for this type of film, found footage, this is absolutely fine. I can't even imagine this film being like cleaned up and made any sharper than it already is. It, it's fine, uh, you know, as it was released in 2006. This copy, though, it's, it's, it's a reminder of just how good DVDs used to be because it's, it's packed with features. Like, it's got a, a making of called Until the Last Light Goes Out, and it's extensive. It's like a 56-minute thing. I watched it last night. It's really interesting. It interviews pretty much all of the key cast, a lot of the people who were zombies. It's really good. I noticed, though, that the only person from the cast who is not interviewed is the main girl who survives and goes on to be in the second film, albeit she was replaced as an actress by the time that second film came along. So given that she's the only person who doesn't appear on this and she was then replaced for film number two. I kind of feel like there's a story there, maybe. Maybe she fell out with the uh, the people behind this film or something. Because she just seemed to go AWOL for the rest of this series once once uh, this film was in the can. Didn't want to do interviews. Wasn't in the second film, but anyway. Um, there's also a bunch of deleted scenes which add up to about 15 minutes in total. I'd say that there's about 11 scenes covering 15 minutes. Uh, so a lot. Um, I watched these as well. 
none of them left me feeling like they should have been in the movie. The film only runs to about 81 minutes, so it'd be easy to think, oh, maybe some, some of these deleted scenes could have gone in, just turned it into a 90 minute film. But honestly, I think the film is fine as it is. It's fine being an 81 minute film. Curiously, none of the 11 deleted scenes answer any of those unanswered mysteries that I was talking about earlier. So clearly for me, it was deliberate that they didn't um, tell you everything about Goke and his motivations and where he comes from and stuff like that. There are also some features that I didn't watch, namely the two uh, commentary tracks. There's one from the director and one from the cast. So they put a lot of effort in, in terms of stuffing this DVD. Um, they were clearly very proud of this film, I think, and rightfully so, because I think for the budget and, you know, I, I think they did a bang up job with it. But let's find out what sort of score I'm going to give it by going to the Bag of Terror. So we got one, two, three, three and a half bloody axes out of five. That is a very good score for a, a film like this. And to be honest, my first instinct was actually to go to four out of five. And then I just kind of changed my mind and just dropped it a little bit to three and a half. But that still means it is a film that you should absolutely check out, especially if you like zombie films. Right, I'm gonna come back very soon and review the Zombie Diaries 2, because they did make a sequel to this. It might not be my next video, but it, it will be coming imminently in the near future. But until then, I will love you and leave you. Until next, until next time, bye-bye.